uh, in terms of ways, again, to re reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we tend to have efficiency at the top of our loading order, uh, and that we'll talk a lot, some today, about energy efficiency. Uh, also, combined heat and power. Uh, some of us refer to that as cogeneration from the old days. But anyway, that is one way of achieving more efficiency in industrial processes or in buildings. Uh, also, renewables, obviously shifting our power mix to uh, more sustainable resources. And uh, again, between the two of us, we'll talk a little bit about where we are and towards the 33% goal. But at this stage, the utilities in the state are at 20% and all have contracts to get to 33%. If anything, our challenge now is looking at the next step beyond that, frankly. Uh, alternative, one of the Energy Commission programs is a Bill 118, Alternative and Renewable Fuels and Vehicle Technology Program. Again, certainly one of our defining challenges is what to do on the transportation sector. We've done a, a variety of programs there to, to try to encourage alternative technologies, uh, charging stations, hydrogen refueling stations, you know, a variety of different technologies. And again, in a way, it's a drop in the bucket for the transportation system, but again, some progress on that front. Uh, other big challenge we have, frankly, is jobs in the economy in California. And certainly all of us are concerned about how to revitalize California and see the way to do that is through innovation. And so basically, again, looking at our, our key challenges I tend to put as reducing greenhouse gas emissions, reviving the economy, and tend to see that bringing jobs in through innovation and particularly in the energy areas. In terms of contingency planning, I guess one of the things to talk about is one way the organizations work together is, as I mentioned, we have a statewide uh, planning study in, in the Ener Independent Energy Policy Report. In last year's report, we had a chapter on nuclear power, which was motivated pretty much by the Japanese tragedy, but also looking at what we were doing in California, looking at seismic studies. The, the legislature would really like to use some of the 3D imaging to better understand the fault systems around San Onofre and Diablo Canyon. And so we had a workshop. And it was an unusual event in that it was a combined workshop of the Energy Commission and PUC. And so myself and uh, Jim Boyd from the Energy Commission, Commissioner Sandoval, and Mike Florio were at the hearing. Based upon that, we came up with a report or chapter in the report which really identified a series of actions that, again, the four of us agreed, on, agreed upon. And one of the proposals we had was we felt that it was important to look at the implications of either sustained outages at the plants or if they were not relicensed. Uh, by sustained outages, if you look at the nuclear fleet nationwide, it's not unusual to have a one-year outage. And in terms of looking at the two plants in California, Diablo Canyon is relatively remote in the PG&E system. Uh, it doesn't, I mean, you know, from a reliability perspective, it, you know, it provides power, but its location is not critical. San Onofre is really embedded in the LA system. The transmission system is built around that. And as we'll talk about in terms of this summer, it was clear that a sustained outage there would have real implications from a reliability perspective. So we asked the California system operator to do uh, transmission planning, looking at what the impacts were for either a sustained outage or if they're not relicensed. They agreed to do that. Obviously, the governor was very supportive of that. And they started launching a plan to do that this year. Well, then it, it turned out as issues came up at, at San Onofre that we really had to, in some respects, narrow the focus and look at what the implications of San Onofre being out this summer were. And so the Cal ISO sort of shortened what they were doing to look at this summer, and it turned out there are reliability issues. And so coming out of that, certainly the PUC, the Energy Commission, and Cal ISO came up with a joint action plan. And you know, moving forward, we are implementing it. I, we started doing the planning uh, sort of on a worst case basis, but it turned out that we need it, the bottom line. Uh, in terms, terms of the actions, one of them is to return Huntington Beach 3 and 4 to service. Uh, so if you look at this chart, it gives you a sense. I think one of the classic charts that you certainly will see again. But anyway, I just want to indicate that there aren't, there's only two power plants in Orange County. Uh, Huntington Beach and San Onofre. And so when San Onofre is down, it has real implications on the voltage support in Orange County. It also has implications on how much power you can import 
from L.A. into San Diego. So by bringing up, bringing back Huntington Beach 3 and 4, which are two, well, more LBJ vintage power plants, but at least they have SCR on them, that had been retired because of a, for their offsets to be shifted to another power plant, that they still have the offsets, still have the permit. So we brought that back online. That's over 400 megawatts. That helps the capacity in the L.A. basin. Also helps in the ability to import power into San Diego. That arc there is sort of below Lugo. So we're, we really are looking at, at the Los Angeles basin, the San Diego basin, and the L.A. basin, more or less the Orange County part is what we're talking about. So the next thing we did is accelerate the Borealis transmission upgrade. And again, going back, that's a transmission line that's up in that area. You can see the upgrade there. And that was a line that Edison proposed, had been planning to do, but they got it online by uh, June 1st. Uh, the next thing we did was complete the Sunrise transmission line. And there's some related out of, outage planning that's sort of in process at this point. But anyway, looking back again, uh, you can see the Sunrise Power Link going into San Diego. Uh, it, it helps. There's, there are issues with it. As you can, it actually started uh, a, week, a week ago last Sunday. Uh, it was energized. It's been operating relatively securely at this point. As you can tell, that and, and the Southwest Power Link both have a similar terminus coming in from Imperial Valley at the IV substation. And they both parallel each other for part of the way and then diverge. Where they parallel are the areas without high vegetation is the good news, or without much vegetation. Uh, talk about those issues in a second. Uh, we also did fully funded flex alerts, and I think Commissioner Sandoval will talk, talk has had a real strong interest in making sure that those have a broad base for community organization of our different communities. And also talking about fully Im uh, Utilizing available demand response, and again, this is a little unusual in the sense that we talk, we can talk about demand response, say in the Edison Service Territory, but we really, in this for the summer, are looking at Orange County, you know, so a portion of the overall demand response. So, and we're also trying to identify what we can do, sort of in the in the half hour function, along with what we can do to push down loads the next day. We've reached out to the military and public agencies in San Diego. Uh, we've been working, we at the Energy Commission have been working very closely with the Navy and Marines on a number of initiatives in San Diego. So it's pretty easy to reach out to them and see what they could do. They are sdg and largest single customer. And so again, there's a lot of opportunities for them. And uh, they have just filed a special, sdg and has just filed a special tariff with the PUC to allow them to take more opportunities to demand response there. Uh, and then finally, we looked at ensuring the existing generation is well maintained and available. In San Diego, some of the power plants are 40 to 50 years old. And so it's a little scary relying on those. Uh, but basically, the Cal ISO has gone out, checked out the maintenance on all this, and made sure and scheduling. Obviously, with San enough, we down, the gas units are running more, but sort of juggled the schedule so they could do the required maintenance in the springtime before we get to the peaks. Um, Basically, I think working together, we're pretty well prepared. Uh, as I said, we were doing a pretty worst case. Obviously, things happen. You know, an example was last year there was an outage in, in San Diego that was an N-1 in September. So hopefully no one has a similar slip up this summer. Uh, but probably our biggest fear, frankly, and that's where the flex alerts come in, is if you have like three or four days of, of a heat storm in San Diego, uh, that we really need to be reaching out to people on those day, critical days, critical hours of those days, to really reduce the demand. And also in those periods of time, obviously along with the heat storms, you're always worried about uh, fires, fires particularly along the transmission line. And uh, sdg &E has done some fairly interesting things in that context. Uh, they've, since the real disasters in 2007, they now have drones to go over the fire areas. Uh, they've changed a lot of the uh, the demand, their distribution system to be able to monitor things better. Uh, they have two full-time meteorologists. Uh, so again, certainly we, we are pretty comfortable in the one in 10 circumstance, but uh, you know, if things go beyond that, we certainly would need everyone engaged to help in those circumstances. So that's sort of an example of, of one of the real-time ways that we're certainly working together 
And I think coming out of this year, presumably we'll, we'll be better positioned to deal with the longer term issues. Obviously, San Onofre 3 is not going to be back next summer. Uh, two, there's some hope it might be, but we will certainly we will be planning as if neither will be back. In terms of our energy goals, looking at renewables, you know, sort of the one of the things that's sort of a real fundamental change is storage. If we can get cheap electricity storage, uh, that's really a game changer for the industry. And so, again, looking at the ways we work together is the Energy Commission, you know, through our peer program, have been doing a lot of work on storage, a lot of demonstrations. We tried to really key off, uh, as, you know, the, our grant money to try to work with different energy entities in California to do demonstrations of storage in California to get experience both on a utility scale and also more at a distributed scale. Uh, one of the things that's very important on storage, which sort of highlight, is the ramp rates. I mean, some of the some of the stuff responds very quickly; others less so. Uh, obviously, if you're looking more at dealing with renewable variation, you know, at, at this stage where, as a war 20, we're going to go a lot further higher on the renewables. But even at this point, uh, you can, the Cal ISO is experiencing for the wind systems. Uh, fluctuations of a thousand megawatts within an hour so that 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 has to be responded to obviously going forward I would expect that number to, to double or triple and so uh, the total amount of wind so again the variation to go up and similarly with storage uh, with solar you know as you go through the solar systems although again that's dispersed around the state but particularly a lot of our DG is in the coastal areas we have the coastal fog come in you can again expect to see big variations there, and those solar and wind variations are different in terms of likely characteristics, and certainly they're different than the likely load shifts. Obviously, if you look at the system in the morning, the loads go up. That happens to be when the wind speeds generally are going down, the solar is starting to come up. You look at the end of the day, the loads are dropping off, uh, although not as fast as certainly the solar would drop off and as the wind come up, comes up. So if, if you look at that combination, Storage is a key way of trying to smooth that out, along with demand response. If we can package that together, I think we'll have a much cheaper. Uh, there have been some recent FERC actions. Again, what I hear from, generally from that industry, is there isn't a business case now for how you really get the well storage out. You know, one of the examples is P, you know, PG&E's pump storage project at Helms. They should be putting in variable speed motors there. But the uh, basic, and they've looked at it a couple of times. The question is, well, what's the revenue source that they would get for setting, offsetting that? And that comes back to what in our wholesale, how's our wholesale market set up to value and pay for storage services? And I, again, as I said, there's a proceeding at the PUC that's looking at this, and certainly there are proceedings at FERC on the wholesale side. So basically, storage is critical for what we need to do. The other issue I'm going to focus a little bit on is, is one of the goals that we're trying to move the state towards uh, zero net energy housing for residential in 2020, for commercial in 2030. And we just adopted, as I said, the Energy Commission has been doing building standards from its beginning. I tend to think that's one of the things that really turns around our energy use in California. And so we've just adopted new standards uh, on May 31st. Uh, one of those is solar ready. These are some of the features. I won't go into that, but generally they will cut energy consumption housing by about 25 percent. Uh, and those are obviously, by their cost effective, we could have pushed the numbers a lot higher, and frankly, in terms of cost effectiveness, but we really needed to respect the status of the building industry at this time. But again, this is the sort of program where, I'll talk a little bit later, we did a lot of the R&D at the Energy Commission to prove these technologies. We then worked with the PUC and the utilities to provide incentives and move these out into the building industry and into housing. And over time, as they were proven, we've now moved them into the standards. Uh, this gives you a sense of where, where we have gone over time at the Energy Commission on these Title 24 building standards, and at the same time, where we need to go in the future to get to zero net energy. And again, I'm just wrong way. One of the key things to get to zero net energy, frankly, will be not only the shell, tightening that up, which we will do another round in 2017 and another round in 2020, but basically reducing plug load. And 
plug load is, you know, remember we were doing forecasting in the 70s, you know, we never quite, well, obviously we weren't thinking of computers, we weren't thinking of uh, uh, direct TV or any of those devices. At this point, one of the things we did be earlier this year is put in place battery charger standards. Uh, talk about proliferation. The average California household has 11 chargers. And, uh, you know, at some of those chargers, basically, if you feel those, they're, they're hot. And we, we put in the requirement that a sensor be put into the chargers to realize when the battery is full to turn off the charging. And uh, relatively simple concept and, again, saves a lot of energy. This is the proverbial vampire power that you've all heard about is trying to deal with that. Uh, and now we're looking at additional uh, appliance standards this year, questions of what are the, we've set in place in OIR, OIR looking at what that should be, looking at industry and, and the participants. But, you know, is it computers, servers, set-top boxes? Um, LEDs. I mean, we've actually, as part of our, have rolled out over 17,000 LEDs and streetlights in California. And most of these poles, people are only going to visit once in 50 years. So we're trying to make sure that those installations are done right and they include some degree of demand response built in. So anyway, but that's an industry where we're concerned about making sure that it's not a race to poor quality, but that in fact we maintain quality standards there. Uh, last thing is uh, obviously innovation has got to drive California. This is, as I said, going forward in the building standards we just adopted. We had the peer research which developed the foundation for that, also on the battery chargers that you know, it was through research that we funded. At this point, again, working with the PUC, we've, we could not get a two-thirds vote to get that, built, get that program extended last year. The PUC has just adopted the EPIC program. And again, that will maintain uh, our focus on innovation in California. So again. Well, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Welcome, and thank you very much for being here. It's always a pleasure and an honor to be back at Stanford. I uh, went to the Stanford Law School, so it's wonderful to uh, be back here. Um, also, I should remember every time it took me longer to find a parking place than it did to drive here, so I saw many of you out there with me looking for parking spaces. Um, so glad we all made it to the room. So thank you very much. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what the California Public Utilities Commission is doing to also help to um, analyze and address California's energy future and thank Chairman Weissmiller uh, both for his presentation and just for the tremendously collegial relationship that we've had with the California Energy Commission. We've been um, a real partner in planning many things and um, they've also done a wonderful job through their leadership in long-term planning and analysis. Um, so as we talk about the California Public Utilities Commission, I'd like to say just a little bit about our fundamental mission. Um, when you look at the California Public Utilities Code, uh, the laws which govern our work, it's, it's huge, it's about this big. But really it all boils down to one sentence, which is that our mission is to ensure that utilities provide safe, reliable service at just and reasonable rates. Um, everything else really flows from this mission. And um, I think it's also important to recognize that the code puts safety first. And so too must the California Energy Commission and the California Public Utilities Commission. Um, so this has certainly driven some of our work and analysis with regard to San Onofre. And so we'll come back to San Onofre in a minute. But as we look at the tremendous challenges, the, the horrible tragedy of San Bruno and the loss of the eight lives and, and the gas explosion that happened there in 2010, it really has caused a fundamental reevaluation of the work of the Public Utilities Commission and the utilities um, and the passage of law to, ensures, uh, to ensure, for example, that where there is money that has been allocated for safety or maintenance and operations, that it is spent on safety, maintenance, and operations 
sentence and not shifted. Um, this last week we had a, um, a, a seminar, a conference on safety, and there were representatives there from the Metro Authority in Washington, D.C., talking about the analysis of the terrible uh, train crash that happened at Fort Totten there. And it's really caused them to reevaluate what does it mean to have a safety culture. And um, they actually had a slide up from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that also pointed out that a safety culture exalts safety as a value over other competing values. And I think it's also important to, to talk about, you know, often safety and efficiency are set up as competing values. And they also showed us some evidence that, in fact, they were not competing value, values. In fact, sometimes safety could help not only efficiency, but also profitability. And that in the airline industry and also the freight and passenger train industry, as accidents have gone down, that costs have gone down. Now, actually, the, the primary other driver that keeps costs going up is fuel costs, but it's not about safety. Um, so that the emphasis on safety can not only save lives and property and fines and years of litigation. As, as a lawyer, I was certainly trained to do litigation, but I cannot say it is the first and foremost thing that I love. Um, but, but that we should look at how we can promote these systems in a way so that they are both safe and reliable, um, as well as provided at rates that are just and reasonable. So as we're looking at that, um, part of our overarching goals, and I think this in some ways fits into reliability and important concepts of sustainability, is to look at how we can also reduce per capita energy use through efficiency and conservation. I know that this building was built um, as a, a very efficient building. I believe it's actually a zero net energy <coughs> building. It's certainly a LEED, LEED certified building, um, but that's why we've got these blinds behind us. Um, and uh, we also want to ensure that there are enough energy resources to meet the demand. And uh, Governor Brown has also embraced and indeed uh, increased the goal to promote the use of renewable power um, in our state, uh, both to give us alternatives as well as one part of the strategy to help to uh, decrease the impacts of California's energy uh, services <coughs> on global warming. Um, so I'm going to talk to you for a few minutes today about um, our program to promote the use of renewables, also uh, safety, uh, reliability, and demand response, focusing on San Onofre, complementing some of the things that uh, Chairman Weissmiller talked about, as well as some of our programs on innovation. So the uh, Renewable Portfolio Standards <coughs> Program was instituted in 2002, and California has been a real leader. Um, so it's been 10 years that we've really been actively pursuing uh, the Renewable Portfolio Standard Program, which, um, <coughs> which began uh, a decade ago. And so in 2011, under Governor Brown, the target was increased from 20% of all of our uh, generation um, being renewable to 33% by the year 2020. And we are well on our way to meeting that goal. Indeed, if you looked at all of the renewable projects that are in the queue of the California Independent System Operator that helps to plan um, some of the, uh, the, the <coughs> plants that will go on the grid, um, that we would be able to meet and exceed uh, that 33% goal. So in addition to that, Governor Brown has also set a goal of 12,000 megawatts of distributed renewable generation. These would be things like uh, solar roofs, also uh, windmills and parking lots. If you drive on the 80, uh, Anheuser-Busch has a windmill in their parking lot um, and other types of uh, distributed generation. So we implement this in part <coughs> through um, the procurement process, whereby uh, the CPUC approves our Prius procurement plans. The IOUs hold a solicitation, which uh, it says annual solicitation. It's been uh, more or less annual. Um, and this is one of the things that I've argued for, is that we need to have a little bit more stability in terms of how frequent the solicitations are going to be so that people could uh, plan uh, for their solicitations. They also rank bids pursuant to the least cost, best fit methodology and take into account a variety of issues like not just um, what is the price being offered, um, but also the profile of the energy can be very important um, because one of the things, for example, solar uh, photovoltaic um, is often one of the cheapest of the renewable um, types of resources now. But as uh, Chairman Weissman mentioned, it is also subject to uh, clouds passing over 
over and uh, reducing its production. So I know I, I woke up this morning um, to clouds. I live in Campbell. Um, it was it was as if I had woken up in Monterey where I was yesterday. Whereas yesterday Monterey was a bright sunny day and the seagulls woke me up at five o'clock in the morning. Um, but it was very very sunny. So. But when we look at photovoltaic production, their production tends to be greatest between 12 o'clock and 4 o'clock. And after 4 o'clock often starts to decline, even when, you know, here in the Bay Area that we're lucky that often the sun will stay up during the summer until almost 9 o'clock. But the production really begins to decline at 4. Well, this is really um, not ideal because peak energy usage is between four and six, especially during the summer. Um, and a second peak is growing after six o'clock, which really is driven by all of us coming home, starting to cook, turning on TVs. Those of you who have plasma TVs, be sure to get energy efficiency ones. Um, and uh, plugging in your cell phones, you know, and uh, so one of the greatest areas of demand that has been increasing is plug load. Um, and so plug load is, at, in fact, the fastest increasing area of demand. So I really applaud the Energy Commission for working to develop new standards. Um, you know, I try to deal with it in part by, by just unplugging. Um, but, you know, you have to check, is your battery full? And my husband, a couple of weeks ago, got a new cell phone. He was very excited. He, he like, had planned a whole Saturday so that he could play with his phone. And one of the features that he's most excited about is that... Um, when he plugs in his phone, you hear the voice of Yoda say, charging it is. And, <laughs> and then when it's full, it says, full it is. <laughs> charging completed it is. Um, so fully charged it is. And it is Yoda's voice. He's so excited. Um, so, uh, but it, it stops that process. But um, anyway, so, you know, it's something that we need to be mindful of, and it's one of the reasons why uh, solar PV is only part of the solution. Um, and this part of the solution is that we need a diversity of solutions. So we also look at solar thermal, which because it, it uh, heats up um, water that is used to create steam can hang on um, and produce a little bit longer. But as we look at other, other resources such as thermal, um, which doesn't have those same limitations, Wind, of course, is also periodic. So this is part of the reason why we have to look at a portfolio of solutions. Um, also part of the best fit has to do with issues like proximity to transmission, um, interconnection. These issues all affect costs. And so we evaluate uh, these issues and also uh, where they are in terms of how they will be able to serve the load serving entities. And then they eventually are, are presented to the CPUC for analysis and potential approval. Um, so we now have over 2,500 megawatts of new capacity. Mm online due to the RPS program, and they are well on target to meet their goals. So we'll we see uh, where the investor-owned utilities are now, um, and uh, we're well on target to getting to the 33% goal by 2020. So we also see the number of highly viable projects has increased significantly. And um, this has also been one of the issues in the past that a lot of projects would get in the queue, be approved, but then would fail to materialize. And so we're seeing a lot of, of maturation in the industry. And in fact, that also the IOUs are insisting that the projects go through more permitting and environmental review uh, before being even considered for a contract so that they can uh, address issues such as the environmental issues that affect um, people, animals, and also habitat. So one of the things that we've seen is just also tremendously increasing participation uh, by solar PV um, in our renewable projects, as well as um, increasing participation uh, by wind. Um, and uh, we are also looking at certainly uh, biomass and uh, biogas, um, as well as geothermal. Um, but solar PV lately has been really the story, uh, largely because of price. 
So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, San Onofre, and this also gets to the issue of long-term procurement. So to complement uh, what Chairman Weissmiller was saying, you know, as you as you look at this map, and here we are in Northern California. Um, I am from Los Angeles, uh, from East LA, and then from Montebello. And um, uh, having gone to Stanford Law School, I, I now realize that actually I have spent most of my adult life in Northern California, with brief interruptions of living back in Los Angeles and in Washington, D.C. Um, and as we look at our great state of California, it is a very large and incredibly diverse state. There are 38 million people who live in the state of California, and 26 million of them live in Southern California. Um, that is why the traffic is worse there. Um, I was there a couple of weeks ago and, had, and uh, had the honor of giving a speech at a graduation ceremony for a program that helps uh, K through 12 kids and their parents prepare uh, for college uh, starting in kindergarten um, and got caught in a terrible traffic jam in Los Angeles at five o'clock at night on a Saturday. Um, well, that's what happens when you have 10 million people who live in Los Angeles County. Um, so, you know, this is a very congested area. This is where the bulk of our population lives. Um, and unfortunately, it is also tremendously congested in terms of power resources. And we still have, although um, starting really a decade ago, when uh, I worked in the Davis administration and my boss was on the independent system operator, many of us lived through the um, energy crisis of a decade ago, we really worked on eliminating some of the constraints which eliminated power uh, constraints uh, throughout our state, such as Path 15, but we still have constraints in Path 26, which um, constrain the ability of power to move north to south. And in fact, as we've gone through the plans for the summer, we recognize that Path 26 is one of the things that would constrain the ability of PG&E to send uh, um, excess power into Los Angeles. Um, so Songs, um, a very nice name for a nuclear power plant, don't you think? Um, the San Onofre Nuclear Generating uh, System, Songs. Um, so, so Songs provides approximately 19% of the power to San Diego Gas and Electric, and approximately 17% of the power to Southern California Edison. But its role is much greater than that, because it also provides what we call voltage support, as well as transmission support support that has been critical to be able to move power around the area and even to import power. Um, so, you know, one of the vulnerabilities that we identified in the IPER report uh, was looking at, well, what if there were a prolonged outage? And certainly um, the tragedy of Fukushima, um, you know, made us um, take, a, take a fundamental look at other issues and vulnerabilities, including uh, power outages that could happen at the, at the plant. Um, and, you know, it seems that that report that was led by Chairman Weiss and Miller and we collaborated uh, on the nuclear energy part of the report, um, that it was prescient in also saying that we needed to prepare for a prolonged outage of both units at Songs. So there are two units at Songs. There's unit two and three. Unit one was decommissioned um, many years ago because of some issues at unit one. So there are, there are two units, units two and three. But when you look at the independent system operator, which is in Sacramento, and they run the electricity grid for the state of California, their um, long-term plans and their contingency planning um, never planned for both units two and three of songs to be out for a long period of time. They always assumed that at least one unit would be available. So what is happening um, right now is the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is still going through its analysis of the issues at Songs. Um, Edison has been working very hard on this, and Edison is the principal operator of Songs. Um, they've had the best minds and consultants in the world looking at this. And um, you know, they have publicly said that what is happening is that inside the tubes that carry the steam and the water that are used to help to turn uh, the turbine and, and make electricity, um, that there is excess vibration. And uh, so this is causing the tubes, uh, which are metal tubes, to lose contact with the supports and that that excess vibration um, in at least one case, um, they believe contributed to um, a leak that happened in January. Um, 
it was a small radioactive leak. Um, so uh, they say equivalent to a chest X-ray, um, but nonetheless uh, is a reportable incident for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and, uh, and I think appropriately caused um, inspection to determine uh, what the issue was. So a number of tubes have been plugged up and these things are designed so that if you have a tube that is not operating properly, you can plug up the tube and just use other tubes. Um, but the question is, is the vibration uh, so excessive um, that it's going to cause a long-term problem? Um, so the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, revealed a couple of weeks ago in a meeting that it held in San Juan Capistrano that they believed that one of the causes for this excess vibration uh, was a failure in the computer model that was conducted by uh, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, which is in Japan, when they predicted how much vibration would happen uh, with these tubes at the time that they uh, replaced the generator a couple of years ago. Um, so the NRC is still evaluating whether or not that is in fact the cause, but also the other question is what is the solution? Um, so the independent system operator has now said that, you know, we must plan for both units of songs to be out this summer and that we must plan for both units of songs to be out next summer. Um, so right now the meteorologists um, at uh, uh, Edison and San Diego Gas and Electric as well as NOAA Research um, has revised its forecast so that they are predicting an average summer in the San Diego and Orange County areas. Earlier um, this year they had been predicting above average summer in terms of temperature. So we are hoping for continuation of June gloom and clouds so that it won't heat up. But we are more likely to see heat, particularly in this area in Orange County. It, was, it should start heating up sometime uh, after the 4th of July. Um, and in, in San Diego County, they tend to have their hottest months in August. And in California as a whole, year in, year out, the hottest uh, days have often been in September. So that is also when we must be uh, really careful. So um, we've done everything that we can, I believe, to bring back existing generation resources like Huntington Beach to speed up the power links um, and also to move forward with our, our flex alerts and demand response. So this is going to be really important because if, you know, we've done what we can on the supply side in terms of generation units and also transmission, um, the flex alerts as well as San Diego's reduce your use campaign will be asking people um, on hot days, particularly when it is hot for two or three days in a row, to reduce their demand. And as Chairman Weissmuller said, whoops, um, that, uh, you know, one of the things that I, I thought was important um, going back to this map as we look at the flex alert campaigns is that when you look at Huntington Beach um, and songs, uh, they are in Orange County. Now, we might have an image of Orange County, the Beach Boys, um, but Orange County today is not your father's Orange County. It is not the Orange County of when I graduated from high school. Orange County is now and has been since 2006 majority minority. It is majority Latino and Asian. And there are communities there, such as Santa Ana, which is one of the communities that is most at risk for potential power imbalances, um, that is a Latino majority city. Um, other cities, such as Gar Garden Grove, that are also at risk for power imbalances, very, very large Vietnamese population. Orange County and San Jose will wrestle each other for who has the largest Vietnamese population in the United States. Um, so it's important that our message also reaches out to the diversity of people who are likely to be affected by um, potential uh, power shortages. Um, and San Diego County, of course, is incredibly diverse on the Mexican border, very large Latino community. Many people there are predominantly Spanish speaking, large Vietnamese community, again, there, um, large African American community, very diverse community. So we, are, um, we really have worked very closely uh, with the, the utilities, uh, with the CEC, the ISO, and others in the state to ensure that we are reaching out to the diversity of Californians who are likely to be affected, including the elderly and people who are on um, medical baseline programs. Um, so basically, we've got a number of, uh, of uh, 
entities that have already committed to dan demand response. The military has been incredibly helpful in uh, looking at their demand response. And we're also talking to the telecom companies and the wireless companies about what they can do to help out with this situation. Um, and as well, they are very large energy users, how they can reduce their use. Now, a lot of us um, also have cell phones. I know I have two in my purse. Um, and many people think, well, if the power goes out, I'll just use my cell phone. But make sure that you know that even if you have a solar charger for your cell phone, um, that your cell phone will only work as long as the corresponding tower that your cell phone is trying to reach has power. And there were no standards for power backup at cell phone towers until Hurricane Katrina. And the FCC re realized that this was a major vulnerability because many people um, tried to call and uh, you know the, the towers didn't fall down, but they just had no power. Um, I met recently with some people from uh, Japan and they said that this also happened in uh, uh, the Fukushima area. That is, people were leaving their houses as they saw the tsunami coming. They grabbed their cell phones and ran. It's interesting that that's one of the things they grabbed. They grabbed their cell phones and their children, right? Child in one hand, cell phone in the other. Uh, interesting priority. And um, ran up the hill, only to be very disappointed that the cell phones didn't work because they had no power backup requirements for the cell phone towers. Now, since then, um, Japan has instituted a requirement of 24 hours of power backup on cell phone towers. In the United States, the requirement is eight hours. Um, so just be aware that after eight hours, your corresponding tower um, may lose power. Most of them rely on diesel power. So one of the things that we've asked is, you know, think about should you have a plan to run around and fill up the tanks? Um, and one of the things that happened when there was the blackout in San Diego, when somebody cut the line in Arizona, is that also all the gas stations stopped working. So luckily the power stayed on in um, the Southern California Edison area, and so people were able, some people were able to coast to Temecula and to be able to get gas. Um, so, uh, yeah, so here, if you were in uh, PG&E territory, we've got a long way to go to Coast Edison territory. So, um, and then just to quickly mention about the EPIC program, so we've taken a fresh look at the EPIC program. Um, and before I get into EPIC, I also wanted to mention that we're looking at this with regard as well to the long-term procurement program. Um, so if, you know, if I can go back to this, when we, when we talk about energy planning, you know, and how do these plants get here? Um, there's a lot of planning and it takes many years to get a plant cited, permitted. Um, but one of the things that we're also looking at with regard to long-term procurement is that years ago, um, that California adopted rules that basically allow power plants to compete for a 10-year contract. And then after that, they compete for summer, um, what we call resource adequacy contracts. So just imagine if after all your schooling, going to the best universities like Stanford, um, then that you could get one 10-year job and then afterwards had to compete for a series of summer jobs that you were not guaranteed. Um, now, this seemed um, interesting to me. Um, and it, it was designed at a time when we were really trying to foster new generation, because at the time of um, the energy crisis in California 10 years ago, California was under-resourced. Um, although, of course, when you look at what actually happened that led to the blackouts, there was not actually a lack of power. It was more an issue of market manipulation. Um, but as we look at resources and the question of something like songs and will it be available in the future um, when just overnight 19% of your power is gone, um, we have to look at uh, both how can we use our existing resources well as well as what new resources we should foster. Um, so one of the things that we're looking at in the long-term procurement plan is whether or not existing generation resources should be able to compete for another 10-year contract because many of these, these plants are built for a 30-year life. So when we get back to just and reasonable rates, that this is also something that can help keep rates lower um, if they are able to compete for uh, the other contracts. So in closing, looking at the EPIC program and what we funded, and so we've created a new program called EPIC. Um, and so we'll have uh, $55 million of funding annually for applied research and development, uh, $75 million for technology demonstration and deployment, um, and uh, $15 million for um, market facilitation. 
so um, and then we're going to be working with uh, the CEC um, that will help us to administer some of these funds and also the CPUC will provide uh, program oversight for these funds because we really want to be able to uh, foster programs such as storage. Um, if we could store energy, that would be a game changer for all types of energy. And that um, the storage has really been a priority for Governor Brown as well as for the California Public Utilities Commission. So we have big challenges and uh, big opportunities and uh, collaboration and your interest and participation um, are gonna be very important in this process. And um, so we're hearing flex alert com campaigns here in Northern California as well. I've heard lots of them on the radio. Remember when we ask you to flex your power, we're, we're not asking you to, to just take a yoga stretch. This is about uh, reducing your electrical use and being wise about your use. So, um, so listen to Yoda when he says, fully charged it is um, <laughs> and think about how you can reduce your use thank you so much we have time for a few questions and I'd actually like to encourage people to go ahead and line up at the microphone I know that takes a little bit longer but that way I think it's a little bit more of a fair process so um, please go ahead Hi, I'm interested in uh, virtual net metering, which is getting uh, your utility bill credited for buying into uh, an off-site um, solar, solar farm. And a bill just passed the Utility and Commerce uh, Committee in the state legislature that would set up a utility or a, a virtual net metering program in California. Can you comment on some of like, the challenges that virtual net metering would pose to uh, the existing utilities? Thanks. Yeah. So um, I think virtual net, net metering is, a, is an important resource, but it also poses challenges. Um, you know, we're really, I'm a law professor of antitrust law as well as communications law and contracts. And, and you know, from a perspective of antitrust and competition, we're really undergoing a fundamental change or we're having more competition and options for our energy resources. But we also have to look at what challenges does this present for the grid? The electrical grid, including the distribution grid, was really designed for power that, that comes from these big plants. And that power, for you electrical engineers out there, was designed so that it has a profile that's like this in terms of the energy waves that it produces. So one of the issues with solar PV in particular is that it produces energy like this. So that has a real impact on transformers because they were not ever designed to handle this level of fluctuation. And because of, as well, the whole cloud thing, um, you know, that there are a number of issues. So part of the question that we're looking at is how do we make sure that we both we foster choice and competition, but also foster a healthy grid? and that we are all paying our fair share to make sure that we can, um, can sustain a healthy grid and indeed um, help that grid to evolve to the next generation so that it can support a greater range of usage. And so uh, one of the things that the CPUC adopted in its recent uh, order on net energy metering is a requirement for a study to look at some of the issues involved both with the question of, you know, are there, uh, it, well, the, the, there are past studies that show that there are subsidies from non-net en energy metering users to net energy metering users. How big are those subsidies? And also, again, what can we do to make sure that everybody is contributing their fair share so that we can have a healthy and sustainable grid? Thank you. Yeah. I'm Mitzi Worth. I'm with the Naval Postgraduate School. Um, I'm into changing behavior. And I think as citizens, we need to understand the complexity of the problems you are up against. God knows it's complex. Um, I guess my question is, does any of your money go into telling the story, the stories that you are dealing with and having to do this for the general public so that they can understand something about what's going on out there? I think transparency is important. I urge you all to, to look at the Alan Alda flame story where they had to explain what is a flame for 11-year-olds. I think in these complicated stories, you need to explain things for 11-year-olds. And I also think academics in all of the sciences, when they report something, they ought to report it also for the 11-year-olds so that the nation can learn from them, just not their colleagues. 
it's certainly certainly a very good point. I think all of us easily have our focus in state government on the specific challenges and often have the various stakeholders talk to us. And the question is, you know, I know we all spend a lot of time trying to reach out uh, to the general public and certainly, you know, as again, as the scientist on the commission, you know, one of the questions is how, how do we have people understand some of the basic complexities of science? Is it climate change? It's amazing, you know, the percentage of our population that sim simply refuse to accept the facts there. And so again, it's, it is always a challenge to take, you know, the sort of complex technical discussions and convert those into the stories that people can relate to. Storytelling is really important. Oh yes, no, no. Next question, and uh, we'll de the people who are up here will try and get through your questions, but I don't think we'll have any time for others. Yeah, my name is Tom Faust with Redwood Renewables. I come from Marin. Uh, as you know, uh, July 1, uh, Marin uh, revolted against PG&E, and we have our own clean green energy for 30 percent. It will supply everyone 30 percent clean green energy, and for, I think it's uh, $20 more a month, you get 100% renewables. Uh, Monday this last week, uh, the city of Richmond is joined, uh, decided to to switch from PG&E. There's a, there's a revolt going in Northern California against the, the low uh, amount of renewables that, that the utilities are supplying and, and, they're, and, they're, and they're growing. I, I want to point out what happened in Germany just a minute. Um, we've got two people behind you. Could you please uh, right, get the question? Right, Thank you. right, right. Uh, uh, two weeks ago, uh, the, a, a country with 82 million people got 30 percent of their energy in two days of the week from renewables, and on the weekend, uh, they got 50 percent of, of their energy from renewables. The utilities in California are crying wolf, fear, uncertainty, doubt. I'm just saying what's possible. Germany has also shut down nine nuclear reactors and is functioning well. And, and here, we're, here we're, we're, uh, we're, we're quaking our boots, shutting down uh, uh, two. They have 82 million people. Their economy is, is functioning. You know, you, you people are inundated with, with lawyers from the, from the utility companies that are, that are that are just litigating you to death, blocking and th and throttling the the system with with uh, with bogus uh, claims. Thanks for the question, and we'd like well, to well, allow I, time I, I, for response. I want to see how the staff. I want to see how the, how they're going to overcome the 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 well, uh, entrenchment. Actually, one, of, one of the things that the Energy Commission has funded is a study by Kima that compared our distribution system in the German and actually Spanish. We really wanted to build off of the European experience. And it does turn out that the European, you know, the German distribution system is much more robust and is not built, you know, as Commissioner Sandoval said, our distribution system tends to be built to move power in one direction. And so one of the real concerns we have as we increase the, the DG on a distribution level is how much backflow there is and what that might mean. Now again, but so we're, we're really trying to, f to learn from the German experience and build that into our thinking. My name is Ben Mehta. I'm ex-CPRI pg and Energy Commission. Uh, my uh, offer to both of you, this is a game-changing experiment being done in Germany and Canada. It's called power to gas concept, where you convert the excess power in whatever into hydrogen, which is then stored and transported along with natural gas existing system. It, it solves a lot of the problems that storage has. It brings clean fuel. It even makes the natural gas greener because of more hydrogen being put into the system. So I'll, I'll talk to you both a little later. Okay, thank you. Next question. Yes, my name is Robert Ferber from both San Jose State University and Sustainable Silicon Valley. I have a bit more of a domestic question. Uh, you spoke earlier about the health of the grid and also about the grid having to change directions. What is California doing with high voltage DC transmission, especially as offshore power generating technologies uh, tend to become more of a reality? 
Well, certainly in the offshore, we're looking at that. As you know, our coast tends to drop off pretty substantially, mm -hmm. so that you know we're looking more at potentially you know, offshore wind would tend to be more in the Santa Barbara area, and obviously there tends to be some visual issues there, and uh, you know we'll we'll see how that develops. But certainly one of the major things, like for Sunrise, is is, is it is a high voltage line, and so again we're looking generally as we're going through looking at the the you know, basically looking at upgrading our transmission system to higher voltage. In terms of the DC part, obviously one of the first ones was the intertide of the Northwest is, is a DC line and certainly looking at some of the longer lines that are being proposed in the West, they would also tend to be DC. But again, those tend to be more, say, connecting California to the, some of the inland wind areas as opposed to necessarily offshore. So thank you, and I'm, I'm sorry, um, we said earlier, I need to make sure that everyone gets to lunch in the next speaker, and we're a little bit over time. And I do want to make sure we thank the commissioner and the chair for their time today.